Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Danielle Schlosser. A few years ago, while I was on the faculty at UCSF, I was directing a research lab that was focused on developing digital therapeutics for people with schizophrenia. A routine part of our work was to conduct evaluations with our study participants. I remember one day, a young man named Ben came in. He was in his early 20s, he wore glasses, he was a little shy, his hair was probably messier than his mom would have liked. He was a little nervous, so when I walked him to my office, I started talking to him before the clinical interview, and I asked him about his personal goals for his recovery. He said to me, Danielle, and I remember, I will never forget, it was so simple and so honest. He said, Danielle, I just wish that I felt like myself again, and I wish I had a girlfriend. Now, there probably wasn't much I could do about the girlfriend part, but I sure was committed to doing everything I could to help him feel back to normal. I was continuing the conversation with him, and I was so impressed by how, how well he was doing considering his recent diagnosis. He was getting his life back together. He was back to school, reconnecting with his friends. So when he left that day, I felt really good about the path he was on. A few weeks went by, my phone rang, and it was my study coordinator. Her voice was shaky. I remember feeling my body tense up, and I just said, you know, hold, hold on a sec, you know, let, let, let's talk in person. So I went down to see her, and she said, Danielle, I just got a call from Ben's mom. He's dead. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I remember so many questions flooding through my mind. What did I miss? What, what happened to him when he left that day? Did he stop taking his medications? Did he have a bad experience with one of his friends? Did he start hearing voices again? And the truth is, that I didn't know. And because I didn't know, there was nothing I could do to save him. Now I know that I am not alone in this story. So many of you have this story. And I imagine it is why we are all here today, to never have another story like Ben again. But I have to tell you, I think that we're entering into a transformational era for behavioral health. This is being ushered in by an opportunity to be exposed to new ideas, new opportunities, new technology. With life expectancy in the US declining two years in a row due to suicide and overdose, we are at an inflection point. It is time for us to re-examine everything we've been doing and consider the possibility of everything changing. I want to take you all on a thought exercise. Come with me 10 years ago. It's 2009. You're sitting in your house, and all of a sudden, you really want a peach. And Maybe you're out of paper towels, and you know how messy a ripe peach can be. And you don't really feel like going to the grocery store. So you pull out your phone, and you order that peach and those paper towels. And they show up in your house within one hour. You wouldn't have thought it was possible. Or imagine you want to go across town one night. You want to meet up with your friends. And so you call for a ride, and someone picks you up in their car, takes you across town in 10 minutes for 10 bucks. And you don't even need any cash, which is fantastic, because I never have cash on me. Or let's say this time, you want to go somewhere new, and you want to take your own car this time. And instead of pulling out a map, 
You just get in your car and you tell it where you want to go and maybe you're driving, get a little distracted by the music, you take a wrong turn, but it updates and it tells you within the minute exactly when you're going to get there. Imagine that. You would not have thought these things possible. These breakthrough innovations, the companies like Amazon, Uber, Google, they have fundamentally changed our experiences and expectations every day. How did they do this? They took the fundamental assumptions of their field, like you could have the world's most successful taxi company without owning a single vehicle, or that you could map every single road on the planet and make that information accessible on your phone. I have to say, I feel incredibly privileged to be working at Verily, an alphabet company with the legacy of Google, our own capabilities in data science and technology, and to apply those capabilities to the most intractable problems in healthcare today. And we will not be successful if we do not tackle the health and well-being of all people and the unique challenges of those with behavioral health disorders. I want to tell you today about the vision for a program that we conceived of with numerous partners that is a robust response to the opioid epidemic, the number one public health crisis of our time. It was with the conception of this program where we were able to stare directly into the face of our failures of the field and to consider how we might do things entirely differently with the sole purpose to do what we all want to do, which is to save lives and help people thrive. I remember so vividly back in 2016 when this all began. My CEO, Andy Conrad, came into my office. He was so passionate. He just saw a presentation where he saw the CDC maps showing the rising overdose death rates. It was a sea of red overcoming large swaths of our country. 115 people were dying every single day due to the opioid epidemic. These numbers were more staggering than at the peak of the HIV epidemic, and that catalyzed an entire social movement, people protesting in the streets, the entire medical community engaged to try to find a solution. And what were we doing? At that time, I had to tell Andy, we're not doing anything, but that is all about to change. But I'll be honest with all of you today, while I was excited by the opportunity, I was incredibly daunted by the challenge. I think all of us in this room recognize the complexity of this crisis, that in so many ways, it represents the tenuous fabric that stitches together our behavioral health care system, the limitations we have when people choose not to seek care, or the fallacy of some of our models, like 28-day rehab is the answer to someone's recovery. So after that day, I remember going to Washington, D.C. to see what our nation's leaders were doing about this crisis. As a clinical scientist, I was struck by the philosophical debates that were raging about the right medication, Vivitrol, buprenorphine. Should people get treatment out in the community or in an inpatient setting? And I thought to myself, what a disservice to the individuals and their families to not have the answer backed by solid evidence. I then went to do some of my own research, and I will never forget going to the SAMHSA website and reading that one in 10 people who are abusing substances seek treatment. And of those who do, 50% will drop out. I thought the numbers were bad in depression, where 60% of people do not seek care. But for this crisis, 
the consequences when people do not seek treatment and the poor outcomes when they do are devastating. Families are left helpless and hopeless. Communities decimated by an entire workforce lost to addiction. And children without parents leaving the next generation vulnerable to repeating the cycle. This is a multi-generational trauma. It is not only affecting individuals, but their families and entire communities. So if we really want to wrap our arms around this crisis, not only do we have to develop a rigorous science around what works for who, but we have to develop new solutions that transcend healthcare and are about treating human despair, giving hope to communities, and helping to build a sustainable future for the next generation. At Verily, we are calling this a learning healthcare system. It is about creating the technical and physical infrastructure to finally help us drive people to care at the right time, in the right place, to ensure that we are consistently implementing best practices for every single patient, regardless of which provider is treating them, and then to learn about the limitations and the benefits of those practices so that we can scale those insights to every community. Learning and discovery are essential if we want to go beyond the status quo. And it is with this system where we will be able to challenge the fundamental assumptions of our field. Just last month, Verily announced its support for 115, a nonprofit recovery ecosystem based in Dayton, Ohio, which was effectively ground zero for the opioid epidemic back in 2016. 115 will be a program that offers the full continuum of care, but also goes well beyond people's medical needs and ensures that we have wraparound services, vocational training, components of someone's recovery that are so essential to give them meaning and purpose back into their lives. Well, we are not doing this alone. We have engaged the entire community in this mission. Church leaders, government officials, public safety officers, health systems, the entire community engaged and empowered with a web of data and information systems so we can capture the value of their approaches. Because let's face it, we need the strength of our institutions to give our communities the foundation they need to truly heal and to give people something solid to lean on in their sustained recovery. If you recall, when we started this program, there were 115 people dying each day due to opioid overdoses. We named this program 115 as a reminder that we are all on a quest to reverse this course. The first principles of 115 are grounded in partnership. We firmly believe that we and all of our partners will do everything we can to help individuals live free of addiction but in exchange, we seek a partnership to advance knowledge so that we are not alone in our success, that we can share it with all of you. One of the key partnerships is that with Verily. We are committed to providing the learning health system platform that is focused on fueling the next generation care system that helps us get to the precision and proactive nature of care that every patient should benefit from. It, central goal for us is to enrich our holistic understanding of people so that we are no longer just looking at the individuals we treat as just patients, recognizing that so many of their decisions and the reasons for their success occur outside of the clinic. There are too many gaps in our knowledge and too many patients are falling through them. 
But I want to stand here today to let you know that we do not have the hubris to think that technology is the silver bullet. We will not be successful unless all of our partners are engaged. But we hope that this tapestry that we have stitched together with the community will be a cornerstone that we can all look to, the beacon that we've all been hoping for, as an example of what it means and what it looks like when you truly invest in behavioral health and the health and well-being of a community. So earlier, we talked about disruptions affecting the fields of commerce, hospitality, and transportation. These tidal waves of innovation happen by challenging assumptions, believing that better is achievable, and embracing the technology of the future so that we could actualize these approaches. I believe that the partnership between 115 and Verily will give all of us the disruption that we've all been hoping for. I think that we just must go beyond the existing tools that we have today. The tools that I deployed with Ben, they fell short. We should not believe that a 90-minute clinical interview should give us sufficient visibility into who a person is, their level of risk, and the factors that will make them successful. So I know if I had a fully deployed learning health system, that we could have potentially seen a different outcome for Ben. So I want us all to consider what might happen if we change the arc of our approach to our work and where we might land if we do. It starts with challenging assumptions, evolving our approaches, and the pursuit of discovery. Because we should not expect the same, that we will have a different result if we keep doing the same thing. And if we keep doing the same thing, then we are settling. So my hope is that today represents the first day of a departure from the status quo. It starts with new thinking, a willingness to form new partnerships, and the fearlessness to believe that together we will reverse this course. Thank you.